Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon panel session. My name is uh, Tusi Harumi. Everyone just calls me Tusi. My students did this. I thought that was kind of cool. Tusi, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I won't tell you what they really call me. But anyway, <laughs> it is my honor to introduce today's panel. Uh, this is what's such a wonderful thing about coming to these conferences and meetings is to meet people from other disciplines. And people call it interdisciplinary. I like to call it transdisciplinary. Mm -hmm. Because even this morning, talking to a few of my colleagues from other fields has really transformed how I already think about game design. So that is what I feel is the benefit for this. So I thank Ryerson and the Chang School for hosting this and all the people that have arranged this meeting. I think they all deserve applause. So I would like to start this panel session by asking everyone to share with us just one, if they had to pick one lesson learned that would, they would like to share with everyone just in case you didn't get to go to their session, what would it be about game design? The one thing that you learned about game-based learning, game design, you'd like to share with everyone, especially the people who may not have been able to go to your session. So we'll start here, Sylvester. Well, I think um, one word, um, listen. Um, one of the projects that I did like um, a few years back, um, working with game designers as well as people from health psychology and whatnot, we were creating a game that is going to be used within a school um, to address um, sexual pressure. Um, but the thing was is that the game designers think that they knew it all. Said so that oh, we can create things that are shiny, beautiful, and people will be so engaged with it and that would solve the world problem um, and, and whatnot. But it didn't. It didn't happen. And what the teacher wanted was something that they can use within a classroom setting that would allow uh, discourse on this particular topic. And it was such a simple game, but the impact was fantastic. And it has been used in the different schools in Coventry, Warwickshire area. So I think my lesson learned in that particular project, because I was leading the whole thing, but everyone was like shouting over each other and whatnot, um, listen to each other and listen and learn and think about creating a solution that will address uh, you know, different views from the different people who are subject experts, game designers, pedagogists, and teachers, and whatnot. So, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Yeah. Good. Um, I think for, for me is uh, two words, um, collaboration and co-design. Um, the, the I find that the process of developing a, a gamified application or a serious game helps to solve a lot of problems within the organisation, problems that that organisation has set out to solve with a gamification solution. Um, having a truly collaborative and co-designed process, a lot of stuff gets, gets discussed along the way. Problems are sorted out, we're building models of the problem, we're, we're sort of divesting our personal involvement in the problem and solution by using methods that enable us to collaborate and talk to each other. And I think when organisations reach a point where they feel like we need to be gamified to improve employee satisfaction or customer engagement, invariably it's because they're not talking and consulting with each other internally in those organisations. So uh, a recent um, example that, that's happened yet again, we were, uh, as an organisation that spent several million dollars on a new performance management system. Um, and they hated that just as much as they did the previous ones. So they said, can you help gamify it? So I said, there's a problem somewhere else in the organisation. I don't think a gamified solution is going to help. No, we want gamification. So, right. So the whole sort of design process that, that we followed, uh, by the end of it, we built um, you know, a minimum viable product, which is you know, a minimum design, which they thought was great. But what solved their problem was talking to each other in a joint design session, that they felt that we had so many silos and issues with hierarchy and decision making that we, no one would listen to us, but the process of designing a game, which is highly collaborative, very engaging and fun exercise in itself, solved half their problems. And what they ended up with was like, yeah, that was great, the gamified solution was fantastic, but you solved the problem with the process. 
So, you know, have a really careful think about what are the challenges that you're actually facing and what are those um, missing human elements that has, you know, a lot of our systems and processes has dehumanised that, that whole system and, and is producing issues that gamification may be able to help with, but it's a systemic problem that needs to be looked at first. Yeah. I like the game Sylvester has started. So in one word, metrics. Yes. Okay, I think one of the issues we have in gamification, one of the lessons learned is careful what you measure. Um, because whatever you measure will change people's behaviours. So um, from a positive side, when you measure stuff, it lends itself to all sorts of leaderboards, badges, levels, experience points, whatever it might be. There's some great stuff you can use. But if the activities you're doing to create that measurement, that score, aren't necessarily quality, they're just quantity, you can end up with some interesting side effects. So I've seen systems now that we've worked on where people are deliberately doing one thing over and over again that isn't benefiting the organization, but it's getting them the points mm -hmm. to, to go up. Yeah, and almost no matter how hard you try, there's probably a loophole somewhere. So you need to keep an eye on that and find it and nip it in the bud as quickly as possible. Short and sweet. Oh. Well, I, I'm going to actually draft on a lot of what we've already heard. So I, I design and help develop games uh, for healthcare and for serious health issues. And so there's a couple of things that we look at. Um, goals and measurements are key to what we do. And integrating and incorporating all of the various stakeholders at the earliest possible stage is critical. Um, and I'm a big advocate of agile design and development processes, but agile doesn't equal not designing. We're still in a world of measure twice and cut once. And one of the things about healthcare is we have really competing, um, actually even languages, right? Medical researchers actually speak a different language than clinical practitioners, then speak a different language than, than patients, uh, and there are different goals. Right, so a patient, you know, I was saying this in my talk earlier, may have a goal of just stopping my chronic pain, whereas the clinical goal is to decrease uh, clinical use, and the payer goal is to decrease opioid use. Right, and so we've got to make sure that we're aligning all of these goals uh, at the earliest onset, uh, measuring the goals appropriately, uh, and 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 then you know developing a system that is fast to iterate uh, and and make adjustments so that we make sure that we're hitting all of the various metrics uh, that we've set out for our stakeholder groups. Right, There's a, <laughs> a lot of really great wisdom already, which I concur with. So one of the key takeaways I would love people to have is right first time and right forever is an illusion. Because in game design, we iterate. And we iterate multiple times. What worked at the beginning may not work at the end. People get bored with certain things. It is the reason why so many of your applications, so many of your games keep sending you bug fixes, as in updates either new levels, new challenges. Sometimes they do really bug fix. But, you know, a lot of the time, we need to think more like a marketing campaign, not seasonal, different seasons, different requirements, and we keep changing that. If you look at the big brands, that's exactly how we should be approaching games for serious purposes. Well, first of all, if you're developing something and gamifying something for healthcare, don't call it a killer app. That's a <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, if you're looking to really come up with something that is amazing, look to the field of neuroscience. There's been a lot of work on what makes something engaging, what is, makes something rewarding, what facilitates learning, what, what is um, retentive. Uh, the scientists that are out there putting their careers into understanding what is engaging, what changes behavior, um, that's what their life work is, and it can inform your design. And, and third of all, if, if you're looking at the emerging technology of uh, augmented reality and virtual reality technology, keep in mind we're at the early stage. This is the 300 baud modem stage equivalent, and we can do some amazing things now, but you have to look forward and see what's going to be available in three to five years because it's changing dramatically and designed for that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And thank you for everybody.
Uh, before we open up for questions and answers to the public, I do have one more question, if that's okay, to ask the panelists to address. But before I go to the panel, I'm kind of looking for someone that maybe may not be a game, a gamer, maybe someone older, maybe wise, but someone who maybe didn't grow up in the game era. I don't know who that could be, but someone who's very knowledgeable about things. Oh, Dr. Bates, I didn't know you were here. Well, how are you? <laughs> Well, you know, we have been here all day talking about the benefits of game design and game-based learning and how we could help different people in healthcare, higher education, and in industry. But what are the things that the game designers aren't telling us? What is what I believe Marigold called the inconvenient truth about game? From your perspective, I know you know and talked a lot internationally about the integration of technology. I see Sears Games as one of those technologies. What do you know? Or what do you feel is the inconvenient truth, or what are you concerned about? Well, thank you for that. I, I'm obviously the magician's assistant in the audience here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess my question is that uh, I, I always not being a... I do play games. It's quite untrue, but I don't. <laughs> I play whist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but my feeling is that Really good games is as much art as it is science. Mm -hmm. Yes. And consequently, I suspect that many games actually don't work. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, I work with professors. My job is to get them to use new technologies. I cannot afford it not to work once. So what could you advise me about making sure that if I'm going to try to get faculty to use games, uh, how can I avoid the risk in games? Mm -hmm. I think that's my main question, but I also have one about cost as well. Um, I also suspect it's going to cost a lot of money, and people always say we can't afford to do it. But that's, that's a, I, I, it's the risk one more than the cost one that I'm interested in. Is that all right? Well, you were actually supposed to answer some questions. <laughs> <laughs> but that sounds wonderful. Thank you. So, yeah, so two questions from Dr. Bates. Anyone? Well, you got, you're all mic'd up, so. I, I'm happy to, to, sure. to start, yeah. because this is something that, that we've thought a, a lot about. And I, I come from actually an entertainment and game background. I have a, my first degree is in filmmaking, and, and then uh, I started the multimedia studies program at my university in, uh, in San Francisco. So I come from this background of thinking about narrative, and it is a, a hit-driven business, right? And Walter's joke about not killing it, calling it a killer app. Uh, is really relevant for, for us coming from the other side. I think that the audience may know that Rovio that had Angry Birds, that was their 54th game uh, when they finally yeah. got a hit, right? And they were just kind of scratching along before that. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we do is, as I was saying before, it's this kind of measure twice and cut once. We, we try to get in, involved in a really deep psychographic analysis of what's going to move and motivate our patients uh, from a healthcare perspective. And then we iterate really quickly. So we actually even advocate you know, paper designs and interactions and really low cost methodologies to try and see if things are sticky and engaging. Because if something is sticky and engaging on paper, it certainly will be in a VR world. Right? And so we want to make sure that we do um, you know, have those kind of cycles, those really rapid cycles uh, that enable us to do some testing uh, to, to see if things are going to stick. Uh, to, to the cost, uh, I would say we always do a buy versus build analysis. Uh, we look at libraries, we look at repeatable sources of content um, that we can then reskin and personalize uh, for that perspective. And uh, I think it's just really critical that we all do that. Uh, Anne and I were talking earlier about how you know, we're both working with different um, uh, clients that are in the nonprofit realm to create mental health games and training. You know, how can we collaborate in those? We don't all need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, and there's a rising tide that's happening with games and gamification, especially games and gamification in healthcare, that I think that, you know, I want to thank Ryerson again for putting this together because I think that the opportunity is for us to collaborate and rise the tide more rapidly. Mm -hmm. yeah, agreed. And I suppose to build on, we would also advocate paper, uh, paper designs first. Uh, we recently had a cybersecurity game, which ended up being a board game. But before we go to print, 
we play test. Now, on average, the recommended average to play test is you play it 100 times before you send it live. Now, practically in the corporate sector, you probably have the time frame for 20. So 100 would be ideal, but often practicalities overrule that. So, so you give it your best shot after the 20, and then you iterate. So the first run is a run of 20 copies, the next run, you might do another 30 with some minor tweaks based on the feedback you keep gathering. So don't ever stop gathering feedback because that will actually feed and develop your game over time. So yeah, I concur very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I also agree because there's a lot of things you can do to reduce the risk, but game development is a high risk business. Like if you look at um, one of the inconvenient truths I, I mentioned this morning is that for your AAA game development, we're talking about well-resourced, very expensive game de devs, you know, looking at tens, maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars to, to produce a title. 10% of their releases produce 90% of their income. So there is a so-called high failure rate or a very long tail of games that don't quite hit the mark. There's no magic formula to a great game, to a great movie, to a great book, to a great song. So it's just like any other in entertainment media that it has got some inherent risks in it. And I think um, the mentality that we currently have in, in this sort of time and space in business is that we want zero risk. But I think we're in an environment where we need to take risks and calculate it. As long as we're reducing those risks as much as possible, uh, we've got no choice but to step out there into the void and experiment. And there's a lot of free to play titles that you can experiment with. I even, I mean, there's programs like for educationalists, um, uh, Mind of uh, um, World of Warcraft in schools, uh, League of Legends, um, uh, even Minecraft. They have reskinned the game and made it a, a safe space for people to bring in their management group or their, 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 their uh, this classroom to learn the amazing things that you can in Civilization or World of Warcraft things about leadership and team building and problem solving um, that and that's a good low entry cost to, to actually do that and actually get to experience those magnificent games and and then it gives you sort of more to work with in, in terms of developing your own your own later yeah I think I would like to build on that as well because um, one thing that we're trying to push at the, at the university we've got issues as well in terms of the lecturers haven't got time to get involved in, in, in the creation of the games and whatnot, and they're, they're worried about the cost, the faculty won't want to pay for it, and how, how do we make sure that the games will be effective anyway? Um, so we sort of look back at how can we remote and reuse existing games and recontextualize the use. For example, the use of uh, the Angry Birds to, 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 to talk about physics and whatnot, and the use of different, different games like mine, uh, Lego Mindstorm to talk about uh, creating stuff and uh, team building and all sorts of different things. And we are also moving towards sort of non-digital stuff, which lecturers can actually create themselves. And we go through this process that what we've done today, that in less than a minute, a few of these guys design games based on the inspiration of uh, an existing game as well as a theme. And I think one group managed to create something in less than 30 seconds. So we should not underestimate how creative we are. We, sh we should not underestimate how creative the lecturers are in thinking about solutions that would work for the team. So we can't just give, give them a prescribed sort of game. This is what you should use. It's about including them in the decision making so that they will understand that, OK, I'm invested my time. I've invested my emotion. And how am I going to change the world in this sort of um, uh, uh, um, activities? I would definitely use it and, 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 and you know, do well with it, I think. Yeah. I'd like to add to that. I think what my colleagues are saying is that you will fail at some point. Yeah, yeah. 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 and that's okay. But yeah. I think it's it was okay. a trick. I, yeah. One of the great things about games is you fail in them all the time. And that's where you learn. Mm. So maybe you need to design a game for the lecturers mm. that says length. This is what you're going to try out. You will fail some of the time. Because once you put it in that game scenario, people feel better about failing. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's what you... If you build on a, a meta game, as it were, for them, yes. I think yeah. you're off to a winner. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you bring up a really good point. One of the things that I stress in my instructional game design class is failure. Mm. How many times do educators spend considering what to do when people fail to make it, the experience more engaging compared to when they're successful? 
I know as a faculty member and as a K-12 teacher for many years, I always focused on success. But now with this game design stuff, I'm actually thinking about, okay, how can I make this experience engaging when the students fail and actually create situations where they do fail, but in a safe environment where it's okay. Because in a game, you fail, you just restart it and play again, which makes it engaging and stuff. So I would challenge any game designer, especially in the educational space, to spend as much time on the failure state. What happens when people fail compared to on the win state? Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. If you're training in a flight simulator, for example, you want to extreme for the rare and unusual situations that hardly occur. Same thing if you're training for anything uh, in any other arena. You have to push the limits, and, and your faculty need to push their limits too. So I, I, I think uh, in Silicon Valley we have an expression, fail early, fail fast. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies to uh, this emerging arena too. And when's the last time you were in a class or you have a class where it was fun to fail? Not very often. Okay. <laughs> so question. Opening up. Yes. Well, my answer was three days ago. Oh, three days ago. <laughs> it was fun? <laughs> oh, nice. I like that. Good. Okay. Any other comments about the inconvenient truth? Should we just open it up? Well, actually, yep. Flappy Bird, if you look at the statistic of Flappy Bird, it was the impossible beatable game. And people played it more than games where you could actually level up. So. There is something to be had that we want to do the impossible. So yeah, I think, yeah. <laughs> Very nice. Okay. And I think to, to, the, to the issue of, uh, of failure, you know, one of the things that we're supposed to do as, as game designers is reframe failure. Let's retell mm -hmm. the story of it. You know, as opposed to giving a child an F, you know, you fail this class, um, if we give them a not yet, uh, then it's open-ended, right? And and the whole thing, even with game design, uh, is that you know we a lot of the uh, game design for health, I should say, is a lot of the things that we're dealing with are chronic and lifetime things that people need to deal with. Uh, and I'm sure that's the same for my colleagues that are dealing with HR issues and some of these other issues and looking to gamify it. So reframing what is failure uh, is, uh, is, I think, really critical for us. There, so there is no fail in games, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and you know, we need to switch and, and turn that into the motivation that you're talking about, Tusi. Yeah. And that's turning around sort of uh, many, many years of, um, of the education system saying you're either right or wrong, right. you know, tick or cross. Uh, but in games, it's not binary like that. It is about achieving your mission, reaching for that quest, and you will do whatever you can to get there. You don't even notice slipping and getting shot and dying and all that kind of stuff because you're focused on the horizon, what it is that you're meant to, you're meant to achieve. So there is no success or failure. That is not in the language of, um, of going on an epic mission. All right. so. Our brains are not designed, unfortunately, to be happy based on success. We're designed to be rewarded and, and uh, feel pleasure because of striving. And that's the principle of, of striving. Yes. That, um, uh, so if we don't have failure, we'll never be striving. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to open this up to everyone here. That's very, very rare chance that we get so many wonderful experts up at the same time. So do we have questions? We have some questions over here. We have Mike, go over there. Thank you. Can you talk about internal and external motivation for learning and how that plays out in game-based learning versus gamification? Yes. Um, I mean, Intrinsic motivators will differ even by person. <clears throat> so the reason why the person learns can differ within an organization. So we work mainly in the corporate sector. On one of our projects, we had six different learning journeys based on the different personas we found within the organization. So some were motivated purely to get up the career ladders. Others were deep diving into topics because that's what they were totally fascinated by. So the reason why we learn will also set the kind of journey people are willing to take. And some of the things we have to learn in the corporate sector are by compliance, because we have to tick a box of some sort to prove that we have done it. So <clears throat> I would say design for intrinsic motivation, but in order to do that, 
you need to first understand the intrinsic motivators of your people mm -hmm. and your target audience. So we spend on average uh, a good section of a project. So if a project is nine months long, three months of that is user research, observing, questioning, looking at what they're currently doing, what they're not doing. Uh, and why they're not doing it, and, and really delving deeper into those kinds of questions. Because otherwise I can't possibly, you know, encourage you. And superficial things will only uh, motivate you to, to start maybe, but they won't keep you going. Mm -hmm. uh, so like a nice little carrot, great to start, but not when the time comes to have an end game. So you need to know the motivators really, really strongly and <coughs> differ and design for intrinsic and add a sprinkle of extrinsic motivators or game mechanics that trigger those uh, on top, but only a sprinkle. It, it's the same in, in healthcare. Uh, you, know, we're, we're, you know, we look at the, a, a division between intrinsic and extrinsic rewards, but everybody is motivated by intrinsic rewards, and not everybody is motivated by extrinsic. So the easiest place to start is to look for those internal motiv motivations. Uh, and, and, and I would add to that um, by saying, you know, one of the things that we look at too is, is this, you know, a highly internalized intrinsic, or does there need to be social recognition, right? And games are really great at that as well uh, for, the, for those intrinsic rewards. Um, and then, you know, there are certain categories where we would never offer an extrinsic reward for healthcare. It just doesn't work with certain patient psychographics. Um, but we, with, with anyone, even when extrinsic rewards work, you always start with the intrinsic. Yeah. For me, I think um, it depends on the context as well. It's like sometimes a game that you create work wonderfully within a classroom setting because the fact that they are playing games in a classroom, even though that game is not it's not as good as any game that they've played with uh, before. But if you put that game in a different context, in an informal context, they would just ignore it. They will not do anything to it. So it all depends on, on the context of where you would want that game to be played or if the context of the gamification. Because um, I do believe that extrinsics um, can help us to discover intrinsics because it will get people to nurture, uh, we will get to nurture the attitudes and the behavior that you want them to have where they would discover their own intrinsic and they don't actually rely on the extrinsic anymore. For example, when we are at work, most people say, oh, I'm going to work because I will get paid, I will pay my bills. But you will discover your intrinsic, like you were talking about our work today, because we travel a lot and we don't have, we don't take a lot of um, leaves and, 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 and one, even though I have 52 days holiday that I need to take, and I could take them all. And I said, why are we doing this to ourselves? It's because we love what we do. We are not paid as much. But I think it's all because that we managed to find that intrinsic within the extrinsic system um, that, that helps us to go on and uh, yeah. do things. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree, because often people say intrinsic is good, extrinsic is bad. But I think a lot of the time you need those extrinsic motivators to, to nudge people, to, to actually activate those intrinsic motivators. So I think a lot of the time we have externalised our intrinsic needs because we've been fed uh, commercialization of what's going to make you happy. It, it's, you know, like society has made us think that it is all coming from the outside and we have forgotten to actually tap into who we are and what actually motivates us. So I think initially within a game-based environment, you have the, the opportunity to, to use those extrinsic motivators lightly to, to nudge them and awaken those um, and, and teach them how what, what it means to really sort of tap into what it means to have you know autonomy and agency and, and all that kind of thing. So you have to it's almost like a re-education process. I like that. <coughs> I see a lot of that in the corporate world for me as well. One of our audiences that we have is quite often, shall we say the over 50s, senior level, who have stopped playing games. So they're, they, they really think that games aren't fun anymore. Mm. And, and what we've noticed is that even after, say, an hour and a half of playing a game, it rejuvenates everyone's love of Does. playing again. And that's it. We all have it right from the start, mm -hmm. that intrinsic love of playing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just need that extrinsic nudge to get yeah. us going. In my case, yeah. it's telling them, you're going to play a game. <laughs> <laughs> Which isn't yeah. as much fun as wanting them to volunteer to play it. Mm. Yeah. But it still works. Yeah. Well, how, 
I'll, I'll throw one more log on the fire that you've built. Uh, I think that with, in today's world, we measure. And we can measure um, many aspects of behavior. And with sensors, we can measure many aspects of what's going on uh, with biomarkers in the person and, and with big data analytics, understand what's going on, and then have a feedback loop to the person. And I think it's that personalization of understanding what their behavior is on, on many levels, intrinsic, extrinsic, and, uh, and biomarker-like, we can build a model. So it's just a matter of, of crafting in tools that we already have out there to, to, to enhance the veracity of these systems, making them more engaging for the individual. Mm -hmm. so, and there's, and there's mm -hmm. no one formula per, mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. everyone. Yeah. If I may uh, contribute yeah. to this, I've been doing some neuroscience research. And Walter, cor please correct me if I'm wrong. This is one of those areas <laughs> I need one of those not, detectors. Not, not, not okay. the public, so. But there's, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've read someplace, well, I could probably look up the article. There's basically three intrinsic motivators or, or social, and everything else is extrinsic. Well, there's actually six. There's social and physiological intrinsic motivations. And I found that's helpful as I design games and courses to motivate people. But can you think of what are the three physical intrinsic motivators and the three social? What could they, what could they be and how we could design to those? Anybody? So one of them is fear and survival, right? So we have intrinsic motivation as humans to survive. And that's probably one of the most powerful intrinsic motivators, right? Do you agree with that? Well, you forgot sex. Well, that's the second one. <laughs> to reproduce, right? To replenish the species. So that's the second motivator, maybe more powerful than fear. I thought he was labeling it under fear. <laughs> okay. And then there's the third physical one, which is kiss chemical pleasure, which explains why we like fatty foods, why we like playing video games, why we like a lot of things that we shouldn't be doing because it gives our brain chemical pleasure. Can you think of three social intrinsic motivators? Validation. Sorry? Validation. Validation. Well, yeah, OK. Social pressures. Competition is one. Social, we want to be dominant. So that may help with some of the other ones, right, and stuff. One other one I thought was interesting was a happy smile. So we're intrinsically, to see, I'm, I'm attracted to a happy smile where someone else was frowning all the time, I kind of stay away from. And the other one is a kind touch. Now, I wouldn't recommend this for most educators in today's society, and I tell that to my students, but we are. We are attracted to kind touches and hugs and that kind of stuff. But those, I've learned, are the basic intrinsic motivators, and everything else, I've heard, is really extrinsic which I thought was fascinating. So. Thoughts and the questions, please, for the panel. We've got many. Microphone. So many of us, we are game designers, instructional designers, course designers, whatever designers. I think that one of the main skills or things that we can learn is actually playing from games. Can you maybe name some, name some examples of games that you have played recently that you think that we can learn a lot to incorporate as part of our practices? There are some conditions. Please don't use Minecraft, World of Warcraft, and Pokemon Go. Yeah. <laughs> and Civilization and SimCity. Thank you. So, so we're not supposed to mention those, or? No. That's no. <laughs> oh, excluded. Yeah, they, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. okay, they'll be mentioned. Yeah. There is one game that I always say to anyone that I meet anyway, it's um, a, a game which is called Black Box. It's a mobile game. And one thing that I like about this game, because I like to be challenged, um, this game doesn't tell you how to play. There are a lot of puzzles that will appear on your phone. You have to discover how you can solve them. You could either throw your phone or you can just click on different things. And then you, you, will, you will sort of learn how to, how to do it. And this game I've played for about three years now, I'm still playing it. And um, I think four of the puzzles on there I've not solved, I think, six months. It's still there. I'm still trying to figure out how to solve it. And, and I'm still engaging with it, so that, that is saying something. Um, and each time it would nudge me, say, oh, there's a new puzzle that will appear, and then you can, you can, you can, you can solve it. And one was quite, quite, quite good, actually. It said you have, you have to travel. 
which is a bit strange. It's like if, if say, you play in a city in Leamington, you have to travel somewhere to reach that distance so that you get the next one. And then I think I managed to complete the whole thing when I traveled to Spain. So you need to travel around to actually solve that particular puzzle. If not, you can't solve it. Um, so I find it interesting. And, and there, there is another one as well where you will have to wait for sunrise. So <laughs> and um, those who know me, I don't like mornings. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to do it and wait for some ways. Okay, next one. Anyway, yep. So black box is one of the things that is possibly the next big thing in terms of game design. Something that is random, people don't actually know how to solve it, and that is based on curiosity and problem solving. Yeah. I played a game recently at a hackathon. We were all waiting for the, the, the hackers to do their jobs. And um, one of the guys had brought in a game called Dixit. So it's a card game where you have to explain what's on your picture without giving away the picture. Everybody puts their pictures on, and then whatever the closest statement is, you push a wager in against it. So you, you say, well, actually, I think the description is this. So you need to make it slightly cryptic, cryptic enough for people not to guess your card, but not too cryptic that they can't guess it because you also lose if uh, they can't guess it at all. And it's a wonderful game and it was actually interesting because you learned a lot about the people around the table and how they explain something and how we visually actually arrange our information where you kind of say, well, actually, well, to me, looked like this. And then you looked at the actual picture of that I was given and you kind of go, oh, I would never have visualized it like that. So it gave an interesting perspective on how we can explain things. So it was a, it was it was a really fun game, and I've you know I've ordered it on Amazon as a result of it. So so yeah, it's one I recommend to get to know people. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. uh, could I use a virtual reality game? Um, yeah, sure. Um, because it was, uh, you know, this is one that went, ran for an hour. So you literally had to carry your, you know, wear your Oculus, but you're carrying a backpack with the, the, the laptop in it. Now, I don't like shooters, and I went there begrudgingly for research purposes. Um, but I just, uh, and with the, the team, that I assembled a team from a, from a client, um, and it was the most amazing experience. It was my first uh, VR, like it is a physical thing, rather than just sort of wandering around and sort of looking inside. But it just, it, you know, the adrenaline was pumping. I said I hated shooters, but gee, did I know how to get into position? We all, you know, and, and you know, and sort of in terms of helping each other out, it's like, and I don't know, have I watched a lot of military films? But it's just, I had powers I didn't know I had in terms of handling guns and, and all that kind of stuff. But it's it's just, it was, we were exhausted, breaking out in sweat and the whole thing. But it made me confront, uh, I have vertigo, right? Uh, and the final scene that we had to play, we all, you know, and remember we're in one big uh, room like this, blackened, um, you know, it's, it's just a warehouse and nothing else in it. And I knew that because that's where I put my gear on. Um, but it's just uh, confronting fears, I think, is a really sort of amazing element in this virtual reality game. So uh, we, uh, and they didn't tell us, they said there's a twist at the end, and I didn't know what it was. You know, I didn't tell them all my fears about virtual They just wanted to know if we all had heart conditions. <laughs> 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 and, and the final scene, you know, we had to, our team sort of uh, killed all the zombies that we needed to kill. We had to be, we were beamed up to the top of a 50-storey building. And from there, a chopper was going to come and pick us up and take us to safety. So I got beamed up there and then sort of like a, we found that, oh, change of plan, the chopper can't land on this roof, it's on the next building. So this you know, ladder appears, you've got to walk across one 50-storey <laughs> building to another. Like, and I said, no, that's it, I'm taking off my And then it was like, oh, I'm in this, uh, yeah, you know, gosh. dark and, you know, so, okay, so they said, okay, Marie, go walk across the room and then put your headgear back on. So I said, okay, so I did the walk of shame. All my mates were standing there with their guns, like, hurry up, will you? So I walked across, put my headgear on, and I was in between these two buildings. I let out the most longest, loudest, primal scream <laughs> that you'd ever hear. And it's just like, I knew where I was a split second ago. But see, the mind is just an amazing thing. So these experiences enable you 
to connect with parts of your brain that you thought that you were in control of, but no, it's not. So, and so I think the confrontational nature of those things, it's, uh, oh, it's, it's run by a local VR company. It was... Yeah, you have, or, but I think they've got franchises all over the world. So, but, yeah. give me your card and I'll let you know who they are. Okay, but that's, yeah, so a VR experience I think is amazing. You can learn all sorts of different things, apart from shooting zombies and that kind of stuff, but, yeah. <laughs> I think I, I agree completely. I think there's a lot of things that are in VR that are really remarkable. And um, the founder of Atari, and you guys know Nolan Bushnell, probably the founder of Atari, one of his sons actually recently spun up uh, a VR game company um, called 2-Bit Circus. And they're popping up these little VR uh, limbic environments, right? And so, you know, it's with via micro movements. So you put the headset on and you walk the plank to save the cat. Walter actually showed an example of that in his talk. Or you, you zoom up in our window washer in the highest building in Shanghai, and then you're supposed to step out. And you actually feel the micro movement of the platform that you're stepping on. And so these, these types of experiences can really show you know, how we're not in control yeah. of our brains. Even when we think we are, you can close your eyes, and you know you're not there, but, but you are. Um, I, I think for me, I, I, I love those types of things. And I love how we're actually creating that, you know, enhancing that narrative with it. Um, but I'm always really interested in, in two types of games. Um, one is an open sandbox game where people are enabled to create a world. And I think that uh, via tapping into one's creative juices, you get them much more engaged and emerged in a world than just having, uh, you know, complete constructs, right? And so, um, you know, I, I won't bring up MC, but that's, uh, you know, but Sploder is another one where kids can go in and create their own game world. So open sandbox is a, is a fave. I'm also a huge fan of anything that has an intensive exploratory narrative. So if, if folks have seen the Bartles chart of game users, oh, now nearly 800,000 people have taken the test with what kind of game player are you? The majority of people fall into the explorer category. Or, or you know, when we all actually have these heat maps of where we are, are we first person shooters and explorers? I know everybody up here knows this. But we're, you know, there's a, this huge map on exploration. And I think narrative and, uh, and open sandbox games allow us. Um, so, you know, a great narrative game, this is going back a couple years now, though, is Journey. Um, by that game yeah. company. Uh, this is a game that I think yeah. opened the world of, uh, of big games to women and a whole other group of people that have previously not played games. Um, and, and I think that you know any any game that enables us to do that uh, and physically get involved, like you know the Wii Fit and Xbox Connect, where we're actually able to interact in in real world uh, in 3D, are are amongst some of my favorites that I'm seeing come out. Yeah, actually, building on the journey, there is a game that won the best game in the BAFTAs in the UK. It's The Remains of Edith Finch. And it's an explorative game. It is awesome in terms of graphics. But sometimes you're you as a, as a human. Sometimes you're an owl, a cat. And you go through the story in different personas. But you don't know until you click a flashing object. So you get to know Edith Finch, and you have to discover the remains of Edith Finch, the sixth generation family house and all of the things that happen. It's the most immersive. If my learning in corporate was like that, I wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it was so engaging. It was so, so, it so drew me in. It's a PlayStation game, and there's a fantastic YouTube walkthrough. So by all means. Sorry. <laughs> it's difficult to add to all those games, mm. except for the one thing I noticed from all of them, which is everyone's most excited about their new experiences. And I think that's the great thing is there's so many games out there. Mm. Just go and play new ones. Yeah. yeah, try out new ones all the time and just mm. think about them from how you might use them as well. That's mm -hmm. what I quite like doing. In fact, sometimes we even just take an existing game and add a new, new game mechanic to it and see yeah. what happens. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a nice, uh, what's the last one? Jenga, do you know Jenga? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just add a timer. The laugh add some tension to it. Yeah. Yeah. Have fun with that. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's what I would do. Is, and that's the bit I enjoy most about doing this sort of event, is finding out other games that I hadn't heard of, mm. and then going away and playing them. So your homework is to play more games. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's actually my homework for my class, is to play video games. That's why I have such a large class and stuff. So we've got time for one or two more questions. One or two more questions. Some hands up. Hands up here. 
Uh, hi, my question is for Beth. Um, I'm Nagina, I'm from Ryerson uh, Tank School. Uh, your talk was really impressive and very intriguing and interesting. So my question to you is, uh, for your reset digital therapy, did you actually encounter any challenges while accessing uh, for your stakeholders when they were accessing, like using your digital therapy? Yeah, th thank you very much, firstly. Um, uh, and yes, whenever you're dealing with uh, patients in particular, uh, there are challenges. There are uh, privacy and security challenges, and we want to be very mindful of a lot of the games and apps um, that I've been involved in developing are in the mental health space, uh, as well as you know the privacy around just patients' health information. Uh, is really sacrosanct, but you know, mental health actually holds additional stigma uh, for patients, and and so you know there are a number of challenges. Uh, we start with, um, you know, going directly to uh, our clinicians uh, and clinical care groups, and work with institutions that you know can help us with that. Uh, we need to you know be you know particularly. Um, uh, cognizant of, uh, of keeping patients safe in these environments, right? And as we're doing experiments, you know, we actually have to abide by IRB regulations and all of that, uh, but, but there are some additional standards. Uh, in the U.S., um, um, mental, uh, mental health and addiction also fall under the CFR Part 42, so it's an additional uh, safety and, and privacy uh, levels, uh, so it can make it difficult. One thing that's actually helpful, though, is there is no lack of patients looking for help, mm -hmm. and you know, and once patients actually begin to find out about this, you know, via Craigslist or other kind of notifications, and then you know, we have to run them through our systems. Uh, we do get a lot of people who basically just volunteer. Hi, I'm Tanya Kellen with Promina VR, and thank you so much for sharing so much learning. And this room is so smart, <laughs> fabulous. Uh, what would be your top three words for those that are building new products on how to create the next iteration of what you'd like to see out there? What would be the top three words that you would give that, those people? I'll give, I'll give two. Yeah, go ahead. I'll give two. Uh, measure. I, I think uh, in today's world, you have to measure and provide dynamic feedback uh, constantly. Engage. I think in order to to really have any value, you have to have cognitive engagement. And that's what all the things we've talked about here is basically engaging the person. But that's two, uh, how, how about one more? I think, more? yeah, I have inclusive by design. Yeah. Um, so that you make it accessible and open to all generations, all age, well, generations, gender, um, cultures, but also physical abilities. So, you know, my niece is very highly handicapped and she loves games, but some of them she can't play or not play uh, in a traditional way. She needs to have adaptations. So, you know, so they're inclusive by design would be my wish for all new products. I'd say for, for like a next generation, um, the things that I would look for, for uh, is um, biofeedback and objective measures, uh, you know, building on what Walter was saying around measurements, bio is great. Um, transferability from the game world to the, the real world. Uh, and, and then, um, you know, uh, user uh, generated data or user generated content. You know, how can your users in this environment feedback and help build the game? Uh, going back to something Ann said earlier, um, we need to keep our games really fresh, right? And if you've got this user base and they're in user generated content coming back in, um, those would be the three things that, that I'm focusing on in my work. I quite like that. So add a, add a tool for them to create extra levels, as it were, like, yeah. like Super Mario Maker. Are you thinking creator-driven tools? Uh, yeah. Yeah, user-generated content, right? So, mm -hmm. that, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So put some effort into actually building that tool for them to build more of your tool. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. I like that. What would I add? I'd add the word personalize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so use all that lovely data to make the journey different for each person. Mm -hmm. And all those. Don't forget to make it more difficult and more challenging as people go on. And I think one of the things we see a lot in the corporate world is gamification often just gets launched and they haven't thought about what's going to go on and happen next. We're in two weeks or in four months or whenever. What happens when someone's learned it all? How do you still keep them engaged for the long term? 
So uh, I think long-term intrinsic motivation. What's in it? Mm -hmm. So we got another uh, question. One more last question. Yeah, we've got one more here. I'm going to go back to the academic world. So you were talking about uh, your um, your your paper-based stuff and things like that, and that's yay HCI. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how do you measure play? Do you use uh, the pens tool or GQ or or the flow model? What model are you trying to use? I, I've had some experience with pens and GQ and flow, and okay. the GQ doesn't work very well. So I don't know if you've <laughs> flow had any experience mainly. with that. <laughs> yeah, flow mainly. Um, but then also, I suppose, especially in the corporate sector, uh, we need to measure how easy, so if we know how long time they have to learn a game, how much investment will be made in that, that will dictate some of the gameplay. So the cybersecurity game we made for a conference of insurance brokers, they needed to learn the game within 10 minutes flat. They needed to also experience the game and the game effects within less than 45 minutes. So you're immediately driven by time constraints. So, so the first round was learning the game mechanics. Second round was gameplay. Third round, it became tricky. And after four or five, you either lived or died in the game, which gave you the learning how cyber impacts. So flow is, is, a, is the critical measure. And flow, for those of you who don't know what that means, it's sort of the, the on one side, how easy it is, and, and on the other side, how much skill I have to play the game. And you sort of need to create a happy medium where you're constantly being challenged, but you're also still keeping the enthusiasm and the motivation going. So, so most of the time in corporate, we actually need to think very practically, down to brass tacks. OK, how much time do we have? How much do deliverable do we have? How much budget do they have? <laughs> um, and then we work backwards from there on making it engaging. And then the balancing of the game took us at least uh, 20 play tests to get the numbers to work correctly. So, yeah. Just one interesting thing about flow that I found out as well from neuroscience is that people actually have to get out of flow to think. So, mm -hmm. you're in a kind of a subconscious state where you're in flow and you're not thinking about stuff, but you're not learning much. You're just reacting, yeah. which is good because you're codifying the skills. So, you are reacting, which is good. Yeah. And you want to get people there. But one thing that I liked, there was an article called In and Out of Flow. So if you're trying to get people in flow, that's great. But if you're trying to teach something, you also have to get them out of flow and back in flow. So, all right, one more question. Can, can I question? add one thing, to that, which is, I agree with everything no, you said. Sorry. The other thing we would measure is the virality of it. How much, how likely the players tell other people in the organization. Because particularly in the corporate setting, words got to pass out so that people want to play. And if, if they've enjoyed it enough, they will tell other people and they'll be proud of this game they've played or maybe they had some input in and then word spreads. I don't think that's probably the same in any situation. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. One, one more question out here. My name's Hilary Martin. I work at the Ted Rogers Leadership Center and I'm creating serious games for ethical leadership. So one of the games that we're creating right now is around sexual harassment in the workplace and involving perspective taking. They're narrative games, they're um, interactive fiction games, and we're working with uh, faculty who are going to be incorporating them into the, into the learning process in their classrooms, because we have an infusion model. We want to bump up the skills around ethical decision making for people in business. Um, in part, this helps with Ontario um, the ever-changing Ministry of Education goals around soft skills development. What are the, so my question to the panel, given that context, is what are the really amazing examples of measuring, communicating, enriching learning outcomes using games? I'm using a product management flow to create a good game, an engaging game, games that can be played in a really short period of time. But in terms of learning outcomes and impact, what would you recommend that I look to? Uh, I think from, from my 
experience in terms of the games that we created in terms of because that topic is quite huge and it's it's subjective as well um, in, in, in the way the scenarios that can be said. But most of the games that we created within that sort of domain, we, re, we, we always encourage people to include it as part of a deb uh, debriefing and discussion because the impact can only happen when that particular game is used within a classroom setting as a discussion piece because that will allow them to actually talk about their own action within those games mm. and talk about uh, the decisions that they make, why they make that sort of decisions. Uh, was it an informed decision or it was just something that they just decide to pick because that is the only thing that they would uh, relate to. So I think debriefing and reflection as a discussion around a particular game, I think, is, is key. Actually, I, in my work, I have a learning gamification framework. And the third level is all about proof of learning. Now, proof of learning, first of all, starts at I can fill in an evaluation form about the topic. Second level, more um, self-reported, how do I feel my skills have improved? Third level, other people's recognizing that I've actually implemented that skill. And then a 360 degree feedback on how well and the quality of that skill to the extent of then going further. And for some people that will happen, for some people it won't, is uh, going further to teach somebody else, lecture in it, really become an evangelist for the topic. So it's sort of a scale up of where Kirkpatrick may be left off and going beyond that. Because I think, and with future technology, I would love to see that into a blockchain scenario where people can get timestamp proof points where you measure at different intervals how much more um, somebody's skills improves over time and whether there's a tipping point where you start falling backwards, mm -hmm. where you might need to refresh. Uh, so that would be what I would do uh, on top of the debrief. So I think that um, to Anne's point, you have to take what's subjective and make it objective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there has to be some criteria that you establish as a, uh, and it needs to be personalized a bit, but uh, you need to have some measurements uh, in order to show that your system is working and that the individuals are progressing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I think we're out of time. So please help me and thank the panelists. Great discussion, thank you. Um, one quick thing that I think people we didn't, I didn't hear during the solo session today is what you also do before, during, and after gameplay is just as important as the game. So I thought I'd leave you with that and kind of segue into what are we going to do after this conference? So one of the things I love coming to conferences, getting all this energy and all this idea, but then when you get back to work, it's like, oh, you got to get back to work. So I want to encourage or maybe um, challenge the chain school as well as the panelists as well as myself to see what we can do after this so you know when you get back to work a month from now two weeks from now a month from now whatever that might be what are you going to do with this information and it's hard but usually the hard is what's good so once again i'd like to thank everyone panelists <laughs>